Good morning, everyone. I am super excited to be here. It's always such a pleasure to, to have this opportunity to connect with this particular community. The response is always great. I love the questions. I love to get the, the fact that we get this opportunity to, to learn together and to really develop some of these techniques. And I can honestly say that from the questions and from your experience and your training history, I learn just as much from each time I give this particular presentation or dive into this topic because there's so many little nuances. I've made a couple of tweaks to this one as well to capture some of the additional information that often comes up within the Q&A portion. So I'm really excited to be able to share some of that new information with you as well. What we are going to be spending the next give or take 90 minutes to two hours on today is the topic of conditioned relaxation. We're focusing, focusing specifically on that idea of teaching a relaxation response, not only for its own benefit, but also for the practical significance of everything else that comes along with that. And if this is something that's new to you, or you've tried it perhaps one way and you're curious about others or additional applications, then I think you're gonna have some good stuff coming your way over the next couple of hours. So where we're gonna get started, not only is with that quick little view of Cornelius on your slide, who, well, the advantage of doing this from the home office is that you get the ability to actually see Cornelius in real time, sort of hanging out and joining me for the, for the presentation today. This is him in the photo here practicing uh, his version of the relaxed down and that relaxation posture. Here he's practicing that outside a brewery in Portland because, well, I live in Portland. And so this is an important life skill that we must be able to have if we're going to be able to enjoy time out in the world with our dogs. So we are going to kick off not only with the adorable Cornelius, who I actually almost forgot to mention today is his birthday. So that's a very exciting day for his participation here too. We'll throw a party for him later. But what we're going to be focusing on first here is the relevance of this particular technique. Why are we spending time on this at all? And then how do we teach it? How do we start with the foundation education of this particular technique? And where do we go with it? Once we've got the basic foundation, then what? What happens next? And we're gonna spend some time with some troubleshooting. As Karine mentioned, yes, there will be videos throughout. If there's a little bit of choppiness, then feel free to come back when you get the recording link and watch them for that nice, smooth streaming that Karine will make sure that we have available to us as part of the captured version of this particular presentation. Now, for me, my perspective on this particular topic is as someone who is typically working from the angle of intervention meaning the vast majority of my clients come to me with a problem. They've got something they're saying, gosh, my dog is really struggling in this context or this one, or we're really trying to build this, but we're just not making progress. So I'm typically thinking about this particular slide first. What is our goal of behavior modification? And in the simplest of terms, we're often focusing on changing the emotional response of the learner or we're changing the behavioral response of the learner or both. And for, for people who have sort of been around the block a few times with regard to behavior modification, you know that it's often both, right? Even if we're focusing on the emotional response, new behavior patterns often start to emerge. And if we're focusing on the behavioral response, we're often able to shift that conditioned emotional response as well. So it does sort of move fluidly back and forth. And I'll give you some specific examples of where that plays into this particular technique as well. Now, in the cases where we're thinking about this particular technique as an intervention, we're often thinking about it as an adjunct to treatment plans where we're focusing on perhaps the emotional responses of fear, anxiety, exuberance or excitement or, or even positive anticipation. Any place where we're getting into a level of emotional arousal that may be impacting the animal's ability to respond appropriately to training exercises or to perhaps access all of the tools that are in their toolbox when they're at a lower arousal level. 
And then in other cases, we're thinking about it more from the behavioral side, more the operant side. What is the animal doing in that particular circumstance? And if we could reinforce and strengthen a different response pattern, then what would that give us in terms of therapy? So we're looking at it from all these different angles. And what I always, often, almost always come back to within my treatment plan is this concept of the impact of arousal. Now, depending on your focus, if you're someone who, let's say, is running agility or fly ball or dock diving or something else, you may think, well, gosh, arousal isn't necessarily a problem. We actually may build arousal into our treatment plan or into our training exercises for a very intentional purpose. And I totally agree with you. Arousal is not inherently negative or positive. The question is for a particular learner or in a particular context, what is the impact of that? And is it helpful or potentially hindering our efforts? So where we're going to focus first is just a real quick sort of behind the scenes look at where arousal may impact the brain patterns of the learner.